all natural regions are uh, fantastic all of these natural regions uh, are uh, very very unique very extraordinary polar regions uh, are more so largely because uh, it is one of those regions uh, that has the least contact with the uh, human civilization that makes it even more unique that goes on to make it even more exemplary of sorts uh, and uh, and also the most exotic one as well exotic in the sense that is uh, it has a uh, least contact with uh, the general civilization the general living culture human beings go on to be evolving with uh, now as part of a uh, natural regions uh, discussion there are uh, two aspects that need to be taken into account uh, the first is uh, going to be associated with uh, what are the climatic conditions uh, associated with a uh, uh, natural region that is a polar region in this case uh, what is any classification if there is going to be so and then what happens to be associated with the uh, the adaptation of the human beings in this case uh, how is it that the human beings happen to be adjusted in this case and the animals particularly are adjusted to this place here uh, now it is in this connection that i will keep on talking about all the type of questions that can possibly be framed out of this topic here but to begin with it we'll go on to give you uh, two glimpses one of them is a uh, take a look at this video this is of the polar region how does it go on to look like now if you going to take a look at uh, the type of questions and the way the questions can be framed out of polar region say eh, that will go on to make a lot of things clear now one of these questions that can be framed will be that is uh, why is it that uh, despite the fact uh, that the amount of uh, snowfall in the polar regions is low despite that uh, there is a good accumulation of snow and that can be a question of course you'll go on to find this answer as we go on to go ahead with this chapter the second will be there is an enormous amount of a snow cover in this region and uh, what exactly is the likely impact of the incoming solar radiation over this place here that can be a second type of it there is a third type of a question that can possibly be framed out of it here. the third of this question is a uh, associated with uh, the plant and the vegetation uh, relationship uh, that is in polar regions uh, only few plants going to survive and the plants are not able to take roots why is it that the plants are not able to take roots and that is another type of a question that can be framed or maybe some of these questions uh, that can go on to be by and large more interdisciplinary in nature and uh, they can be associated with uh, despite the fact that the polar regions are going to be uninhabitable why is it that united states has chosen to habit uh, the north western part of uh, alaska why exactly is it that united states uh, have chosen to make it a uh, very very habitable now that can be a fourth question that can possibly be asked the fifth question can go on to be associated with uh, the animal beings and so on now we'll keep on talking about uh, the type of questions that can possibly be inserted or asked uh, as we go ahead with uh, the topic in this case uh. so talking about the polar climatic region you will go on to understand that a uh, polar climatic region is going to be comprising of all the polar regions that go on to be associated with the arctic region this is going to be arctic ocean that's going to be one that's that's one part of it and when we go on to be talking about this arctic ocean region that's one with the polar region being here that's where exactly the poles are this is not going to be completely a land mass it's not going to be a land region in contrast the southern polar region is going to be completely made of a land mass that is what we are going to be talking about antarctica 
So that is where exactly South Pole is. Uh, and this is the pole of inaccessibility. That is, people have hardly been able to move to this pole. So two of these going to be completely different and contrasting. And it also goes into be comprising of uh, Greenland, which is a part of it. Uh, to understand it, uh, that's where uh, Greenland is. Uh, and when you're going to put yourself in the polar regions, uh, you're going to find that is the entire of this place from here to here goes on to be a polar region comprising of a, all of this circle that we are going to be talking about that's called as the arctic circle that is going to be one component of it this is the distribution of it so it includes the entire of the continent of antarctic and its surrounding waters so it doesn't going to be including only the land mass but also the whole of these uh, waters the entire of it and uh, greenland and uh, the northern coast of uh, eurasia north america and arctic region the climate that is going to be found in the polar region is going to be completely different. It goes on to be of a very different form. As you can understand it, it's divided into places with the warmest month averaging about 0 degrees centigrade and 0 to 10 degrees centigrade. All the places go on to be having a temperature condition where the temperature goes on to be below 0 degrees centigrade. This is how exactly that it goes look like this is the way that the whole of this polar area is going to look like we are going to be talking about it uh, these are going to be ice sheets of such although there are going to be three different uh, types of ice cover ice sheet is going to be one of them like what you're going to find in greenland and antarctic yeah. ice dome which goes on to be having a domal shape of such yeah. then there are going to be ice shells yeah. we'll go on to talk about these ice shells yeah. And you will go on to get a, uh, a better picture of it. Now, there are various types of terminologies that are going to be used with respect to that. So, one of them, the broadest one, is going to be ice sheet. That's one. Second is it can go on to be ice dome. Third is it can be ice shelf. Now, ice sheet, the best example goes on to be Greenland. Antarctic also is a part of it. Ice dome is uh, going to be, that is going to be Baffin. It is, uh, as the name suggests, it goes on to be a dome-shaped feature. But ice sheet is going to be the most prominent one of them. Ice shelf is going to be half on land and uh, half on the water. For example, it goes on to be in Antarctic. Antarctic, there are going to be many ice shelves. One of them is the most prominent in this case is going to be Ross Ron. Ross Ron Filchner ice shelf. This is going to be one of them. There is one of these ice shelves that has been in use that is going to be called by the name of Larsen. Now, understand, there can be a question that can possibly be asked from this topic. For example, you can be given all of these names and then you can be asked to match all of these names. Ice sheet with Greenland, ice, ice shelf and so on and with examples. Or maybe that you can be given certain type of statement and asked to identify. For example, that is identify which is the following region it pertains to. For example, the first is it is an ice shelf. The second is that uh, it goes on to rise and fall with uh, the tides. Uh. The third is uh, it can go on to be of the size of the whole of France. Uh. And uh, the fourth is uh, there is another of this ice shelf of the same type that is called as Larsen. And they can be given variety of names. So one, two, three, four. And then you will have to choose one of those names. Uh. That is how it, it can go on to move ahead in this case. Uh. This is what we are going to be talking about in this case. Uh. Now, coming back to it, we are going to be talking about the polar areas and the polar regions. The whole of the polar region, their equator water boundary of the polar climate is generally taken as the line where the temperatures of the warm end month is not more than a, not more than 10 degree centigrade. Now that goes on to define it all in all. That is what goes on to be polar climate. That's the distribution of it. In the northern hemisphere, the threshold isotherm swings with poleward of the Arctic Circle over most of Asia and uh, Alaska. And it coincides reasonably well with that of parallel over lowland uh, Europe and so on. Now basically that means, uh, why is it that the isotherms go on to bend or shift north or south? Now that depends on uh, whether the temperatures are going to be high or low. For example, 
if you have a 0 degree centigrade of isotherm then this 0 degree centigrade of isotherm will change accordingly in winters it will go on to move south in the northern hemisphere in the summers it will go on to move north because summers are warmer so it will be closer to that of the pole and in the winters the isotherms will go on to shift south because in any case if it is going to be winters the cooler temperatures are going to be having a much more wider coverage area of south south and that is what exactly is the case that means uh, the extent of the polar regions say uh, keeps on shifting from continent to continent of course it cannot go on to be drawn as a simple line of sorts in this case uh. but then there is uh, an extensive area of ice in the southern hemisphere the only extensive area of land with polar climate uh, is going to be the ice covered Antarctic this is the whole of the region because it is a single land mass and it is going to be centered at the south pole in the northern hemisphere this is not going to be the case and uh, there is a degree of a simplicity of the climatic condition that is going to be in antarctic uh, and largely because uh, of the fact that is going to be one of these regions uh, in uh, antarctic a simple part of it uh, that is going to be south pole this is where you're going to be having a north pole as well and these are the poles that we're going to be talking about that's a geographical pole it's not a geomagnetic pole that's a geographical pole so in north and southern hemisphere both of them go on to be different that's what we are talking about in this case here polar climate is divided into two types that's the one that we are talking about and that's divided into two types ice cap climate and tundra climate both of them are different now we cannot go on to say that if the polar climate is going to be synonymous with ice cap climate or tundra climate both of them go on to be different and how is it that they are going to be different for example, picking up ice cap climate to begin with one of them. Ice cap is going to be associated with the whole of the region which goes into having extensive coverage of it under ice. So this circus in Greenland, interior Iceland and the whole of Antarctic. Because this is going to be a complete ice cover as Iceland is going to be part of it. Greenland is definitely a part of it and not to talk about Antarctic. Its general characteristic going to be that is temperatures are permanently below zero degree centigrade and that's the basic reason that it is going to be in a frozen form. That's one. And why is it that the temperatures are low in this place? Here? The first reason behind low temperature is that one is the total amount of insulation being received in the polar areas is low. Second is whatever the amount of insulation that is going to be received in the polar areas eh, as the sun's ray is going to strike, they strike on a ice surface, they strike on the snow surface and from this snow surface they are going to get reflected back. Now as the solar rays go on to reflect back, reflect themselves back, they do not go on to take part in the heating or cooling of the atmosphere. Supposing this radiation would have been trapped and it would have been absorbed by the surface and then it would have got itself re-radiated then its wavelength would have been different I'll just go on to give you a basic description of it why exactly is it going to be so and when we go on to be talking about it you will go on to understand it in a somewhat better manner if you consider that this is the way that the solar radiation comes on the surface then on this ice surface if they are going to be reflected then they are going to get reflected back the wavelength change in this case because it goes on to get reflected so since the atmosphere is transparent to the incoming solar radiation it goes on to become transparent to the outgoing radiation as well terrestrial radiation as well so it doesn't go on to heat the atmosphere at all had it been that eh, this is the way that the radiation would have come onto the surface and then thereafter there would have been a change in the wavelength and the wavelength would have gone on to become a bit the wavelength would have lengthened eh, then eh, to these wavelengths eh, the sun would have eh, that is the entire of the atmosphere would have acted as an opaque body so in this case eh, the wavelength will go on to change only if it is going to be absorbed at the surface the sun's rays is going to strike supposing it happens if the sun's rays strike the surface then it goes on to get itself absorbed after getting absorbed it 
goes on to heat the surface and after the surface has been heated it will go on to re radiate it and then it will go on to emanate form of a, a long that is what is going to be called as one now in this case the temperature will go on to rise and that is what we are talking about that's the way the temperatures are going to be rising here and this doesn't happen this is a process that doesn't going to take place in the polar areas and it is going to be all about reflection in this case polar areas uh, you will going to find a good amount of accumulation of snow that will go on to keep on taking place here the temperatures are going to be permanently below 0 degree centigrade and the basic reason for low temperature is that the amount of insulation received is very very low moreover dense cold air remains in contact with the surface and when we going to be talking about that remains with the ground and uh, this uh, remaining close with the ground uh, and radiation lose losses enhance the low temperature the air is thin the air is cool and uh, the amount of radiation that should be going back into a space that goes on to get itself extended that means the amount of radiation that has to go that goes on to become much more larger so the temperature drop is very sharp in this region the third characteristic that the whole of this region is going to be associated with certain type of winds we are going to be talking about this is a region that is going to be associated with gravity winds when we are going to be talking about gravity winds these are the gravity winds now these gravity winds are going to be almost like that of a catabatic winds which we what we going to be calling it as and uh, we'll just going to show it so there are a common occurrence in this whole of the season and why exactly is it that it goes on to happen and uh, what exactly are the reasons behind it that will go on to be shown but to give you a very general idea that is a uh, let's say there is a uh, there is an elevated region there is an elevated region and over this elevated region this surface has gone to become cooler as this surface has gone to become cooler the air will also going to become cooler this air which has become cooler goes on to become heavier this air that has gone to become heavier sinks it has a tendency to sink and as this air goes on to become cooler as it goes on to become heavier as it goes on to sink it starts flowing out of this region when this type of air goes on to flow as per the gravity it's called as a gravity wind which is also going to be called as a catabatic wind and sometimes uh, this catabatic wind uh, can go on to pick up enough amount of a uh, speed and uh, how much amount of a uh, speed that it can go on to pick up the amount of uh, speed it can go on to pick up can go on to be even 100 to 150 kilometers uh, as well and when we are talking about that uh, it can go on to pick up a uh, 150 kilometers of a uh, speed uh, now that makes it a huge amount of a uh, speed so catabatic winds are a phenomena and that is one of the reasons uh, that is a uh, uh, you will not go on to find too much amount of habitation because it's really 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 cold imagine a uh, minus 50 degree centigrade of a temperature condition of wind uh, coming and lashing the whole of the place that is uh, the condition and this is what exactly is a normal phenomena in the polar areas uh. the third feature of this place is that there is a uh, it goes on to allow accumulation of snow and why is it that the snow accumulates the snow that falls in low temperature environment is seldom goes on to get melted seldom melts up but it can be blown or it can be drifted by the wind since the dry grains do not go on to coerce that means uh, it's not that they go on to uh, the snow cover doesn't go on to confine itself into ice and uh, the basic difference between snow is snow is loose ice is compacted it doesn't go on to get converted into ice so it is still like a powdery form in the region and that is one of these characteristics so imagine this can go on to be one of these type of questions that is a consider the following statements that is the polar areas in Antarctica goes on to have a high snow cover because of low temperature second the low temperature is because of a catabatic winds the third is uh, the snow that goes on to in this space that goes on to get compacted and converts itself into an ice. Now, in this case, the third will not be correct. Winters are really one continuous night and summers are one continuous day. Why? Because it goes on, goes on to be six months of a daytime and a six month of a 
nut time industry time and that is what is going to be the landscape of it think of it how is it that is going to look like this is the way that it goes on to look like in the whole of the region it's going to be almost like a twilight six months of day six months of night in this region and that is the type of a picture that is going on to give in that place rather you have a minus 40, 50, 60 degrees centigrade of a temperature condition. And these are the creatures eh, who keep on moving from eh, one uh, block of ice to another block of ice. Eh, and they keep on jumping into water as well. Of course, they don't go on to feel cool in this place. Eh. And they are looking for, in this case right now, they are going to be looking for fishes. Eh. They are the one who which go on to be feeding on these type of fishes. Eh. Now the location. Uh, so this is going to be one of them that is ice cap. The second is going to be tundra climate. Tundra climate has a location. It is going to be north of the cold temperate continental climate and it's best developed in northern Asia. Now one of these uh, uh, representative centers is going to be that of Barrow Point, uh, Balloon. That is going to be another in northern hemisphere. Two of these regions that is uh, very well known and very well thought of. It must be very well remembered by you as well. That is uh, the two conditions which are having a possibility of being uh, asked in the form of a question. So that is going to be tundra. It is going to be north of the cold temperate continental climate. Cool temperate continental climate. So it is going to be just towards uh, on the margins of the ice cap. But then all in all together they go on to comprise what is called as a polar climate. The winter temperature is going to range from minus 29 degrees centigrade to minus 40 degrees centigrade. That is, the temperatures are going to be lower and summer temperatures about 10 degrees centigrade and annual temperature range, can you imagine? That is, a, it's 50 degrees centigrade, that is the coolest temperature in this space is can go to be minus 40 and the warmest temperature is 10 degrees centigrade. That means the range of temperature between the coolest and the warmest is going to be 50 degrees centigrade. To understand it better, you will find that. In Mumbai, what exactly is the temperature of the warmest month? That may be 35, 36 degrees centigrade. And what is the temperature condition of uh, the coolest month in this case? That can go on to be something like 21, 22 degrees centigrade. So the range is highest temperature minus the lowest temperature that is going to be about 14 degrees centigrade. In Delhi, a place like Delhi, how much is going to be the range? The range in this region is going to be 45 degrees centigrade in the summer that's the highest temperature and in the winters the temperature may go to drop to 1 degree centigrade as well that means the range in this case can go on to be 44 degree centigrade so in all of these regions the range is going to be very high that is a uh, uh, in Delhi it can go on to be of course it is it can go on to be something like a 40 42 degree centigrade in this case it goes on to be 50 degree centigrade even 55 degree centigrade as well now that is the condition of uh, the tundra region as you can go on to see this is how exactly the sun goes on to be looking like completely on the horizon and that is why we're going to be calling it uh, as the region of midnight sun now this is one of the regions uh, where winter rights and the nights are longer with hardly any daylight uh, that is it's a night time night time six months of a night time hardly any daylight and summer days are long with uh, hardly any night that means uh, at uh, even 1 a.m., 12 a.m. also, you will go on to find abundance of amount of uh, sunshine. Maybe some of you who have been to uh, places like that of Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway, maybe in northern portion of Germany, you are going to be having a dinner in uh, the summer season that is going to be about uh, 9 p.m. It is complete lit, bright sunshine. That is a, the daytime when you are going to be having a dinner. It is not what you are going to be observing in some places like India. And being in India, you are going to be far more fortunate, eh, largely because eh, the outer conditions are going to regulate your body clock. And eh, you are at your healthiest best. Eh. You cannot go on to be as healthy in these regions, eh, largely because eh, it is very difficult for your body to get adapted to a certain type of a clock activity that indeed is a character. People in India do not go on to value the climatic conditions under which they go on to live, but that is a really very, very, very good. 
This is also a region where the total precipitation is going to about 250 millimeter. 250 millimeter means at 25 centimeters, that is equivalent 10 inches. Yeah? And most of it is going to be, some of them is going to be rain in the summer when the temperatures are 10 degree centigrade. And of course, most of it is going to be in the form of a, a snowfall. And that's the way. This is another place where humidity is going to be low. And why exactly is it that the humidity will be low? Humidity is uh, referred to as the capability or the capability of the air to hold moisture. Now, higher the temperature, the greater will be the capacity of the air to hold moisture. In this case, uh, the air will be hardly capable of holding any moisture. Why? Because at minus 40 degrees centigrade, the capability of the air to hold moisture goes on to be zero, almost zero of sorts. So, there is hardly any humidity, it's very, very dry. Supposing you happen to be in this region, you will going to feel very, very thirsty. And you are recommended essentially that uh, you must go on to drink at least uh, seven or eight bottles of one liter of water every day. Now, imagine in cold conditions, when you go on to be drinking so much amount of water, uh, there is not so much amount of uh, a transpiration of water from your body. What will going to happen to you? It's not going to be too comfortable being in these regions. Yeah. The third is uh, blizzards are frequent. Uh, a steam fox in the Arctic Sea smoke, uh, or uh, the Arctic Sea smoke, is one that goes on to be found in this region. We are going to be talking about two of them. One of them is what we're going to be saying is a blizzard. This is going to be a blizzard. That's one. Second is steam fog or Arctic sea smoke uh, occurs when the air temperature is much lower. And that is how exactly it looks like. This is Arctic sea smoke, that's one. This is Arctic sea smoke. Uh, it goes on to look like that the whole of the water body is a uh, emanating vapor. And then this is a picture of a blizzard. We'll go on to show you uh, a different picture altogether in this case. Yeah. How is it that the Arctic uh, sea fog forms? Yeah. There is a water body. This is a water body. This is where is a land. That is land. Now the temperature over this region is going to be, imagine, minus 30 degree centigrade. So consequently, all of this air that will be lying over it will be also very, very cold. It will be very cold in this place. Now this cold air, as it goes move over water, as this air goes on to move over this water. Now the water is going to be generally warm. This water is going to be generally warm. Now because this water is going to be warm and a cool air goes on to move over it, what happens is this water will start steaming. That will start steaming. You can go on to understand it. That is, uh, on a very cold day, if you're going to pump water from ground, some of these people from North India would have observed this part. Eh? On a very cold day, if you can go on to pump water from ground, then the temperature of the air is low, while the temperature of the water is higher. And there is a difference. Eh? The water temperature may be something like some 16, 17 degree centigrade, while the air temperature may be something like 4, 5 degree centigrade. Or maybe that the water temperature is 20 degree centigrade and the air temperature is 15 degree centigrade. You will go on to observe that eh, the water goes on to steam. It looks like as if it is steaming in this region. And this is what is called as Arctic Sea Smoke. That's the name that is going to be given to it. Arctic sea smoke that is the name that is going to be given to it and when we going to be talking about arctic sea smoke or arctic fog that we're going to be calling it's a rare phenomena and uh, the uh, whole of the arctic region goes on to get itself filled with a wispy type of uh, appearance in the region and that is a characteristic of it so Climatic conditions of uh, the whole of this region is uh, by and large well known. We have talked about blizzards. Blizzards are very high velocity icy winds. Uh, very high velocity icy winds uh, and they are going to carry a lot of snow with itself. You will go on to take a look at this picture and you will go on to understand what blizzards are. So, 
that is the climatic condition of the tundra region, ice cap climate, as well as the tundra climate. Both of them, polar climates, we intend to have two parts, ice cap and tundra climate. The climatic conditions, in short, we'll go on to call it extremely cold, not cool, it's extremely cold and dry. It's one of these driest regions and why it has to be dry? Because the air hasn't got any capacity to hold moisture. Now, it is in response to that, that the plants are going to evolve and animals are going to be evolving as well. For example, all of these plants are adapted to the short growing season and the extreme cold conditions of this place. There is no possibility that the trees will be existing in this region. And why is it that the trees will go to lack? Why is it that the trees in this region will go to lack? The trees will go to lack because trees won't be able to penetrate into roots. Reason number one. The trees won't be able to penetrate because of a simple reason. The whole of this ice cover is going to be very, very solid. It's very hard. So trees will going to find it very difficult to penetrate their roots in. Then there is a second factor. That is, a, the whole of this region is treeless. Tundra is treeless. And it's treeless. Eh? And then the surface is smooth is going to be completely flat, no obstruction. So the winds going to blow at a very, very high speed. Now, two factors combined that do not allow the trees to come up in this region. Of course, there is a third factor, the moisture availability in the region. There is no moisture availability in how is it that the trees will go on to survive themselves in the region. Now, that goes on to become a part of a question. The question that can possibly be asked here is, uh, that is, uh, why is it that tundra is treeless and consider the following statements about tundra region that makes it treeless region number one that is the surface is very hard region number two the water is not available in moisture form region number three that is the wind speed is very very high in this place all of these three factors are correct so tree is going to lack some of these trees that are going to come they are going to be near to the rivers that is an exception so maybe you can go on to think that the examiner will go to misel you by picking up this aspect that is uh, near to the rivers there will be trees. Uh. So they may go to ask that is uh, trees are a rarity in tundra but then trees are going to be found near rivers. Uh, the second is that the whole of the region is going to be covered with mosses and lichens. Uh. Now you have to pick up the correct statement in this manner. So, of course, trees are going to be found and also on the sheltered slopes. Why is it that we are going to be talking about sheltered slopes? Uh? We are talking about shelter slopes eh, for one reason and that is eh, these are the places eh, where the wind speed doesn't go on to be, be very very high. So lack of tall plants and as a consequence of the requirement of balance of heat budget and eh, also conserve moisture that is why tall plants are by and large absent in this place. Tree roots eh, do not go on to uh, go deep enough so that they can go on to survive. Summer thaw now summer thaw means in the summer season, the whole of this ocean, the whole of this ice surface goes on to thaw out. That is thaw out means that it goes on to melt. So summer thaws turns into a quagmire of puddles. Quagmire of puddles means that small, small ponds. Quagmire of puddles. Puddles, bogs. Bogs, that is where water can go on to get accumulated. They are going to be called as bogs and shallow lakes. Now, these are the places over which a lot of swarms of insects go on to come to feed on it. This is the reason that goes on to give rise to swarms of insects. And it is these insects that are ultimately going to be eaten by the birds. Birds are going to feed on it and this is the basic reason that the birds are going to migrate all the way from one of these polar regions to another of the polar region. That is why they are going to migrate. The surface is going to be covered with a, a mat of lichens. This is how the lichens are going to look like. Uh, mosses, grasses and uh, sedges. Uh, that's the way that they are going to look like. Uh, this is how the surface goes on to be having a look of. So the entire place goes on to be completely covered with uh, such type of uh, features in the region. The region also goes on to be having some animals uh, and uh, these animals go on to be having some response as well. For example, during short summer, large number of migratory birds, we just talked about it. And why is it that the migratory birds will come? All of those birds which are adapted to living in the polar regions, uh, 
they go on to migrate because they, they live for six months in one region and they're going to live for six months in another region six months in one polar area six months in another polar area and in between they keep on migrating like siberian crane you may have known about siberian crane and this is a one of this bird that comes and lives in a bharatpur bird sanctuary and that is why bird sanctuary is going to be known for so during short sim a large number of migratory birds especially one of them is going to be there is a waterfall waterfall is the one that is going to invade the tundra to feed on i mean there are going to be a lot of uh, waterfalls and uh, except for tamijan tundra birds are migratory now this goes on to be an exception remember this name that is a uh, tamijan uh, tundra birds are migratory and one of those migratory birds happens to be arctic tern then there is condor these are the two of them which go on to be migrating using the short period of reproduction uh, and uh, and surviving the rest of the year somewhere we are going to be talking about that part and which are these i mean they can be uh, jaggers uh, they can be geese uh, shore bird which are going to be found in this place and song bird which always going to be singing a song and that's how exactly they're going to look like there is a jagger and a polar geese uh, the song bird uh, and of course that goes on to make this whole of this environment uh, beautiful of sorts uh, and when we're going to be saying that is really beautiful it means that is a uh, the place is going to be full of such type of birds uh, singing dancing and enjoying in the summer region there are going to be good number of animals also for example most creatures either in this place they going to burrow themselves why because they cannot going to survive the cold conditions that are going to be found on the surface they going to burrow and this is going to be lemming lemming is going to be one of them that it can go to burrow it hibernates in that place some of them they're going to migrate the for example one of them is caribou reindeer and musk oxen all three of them that is going to be lemming lemming that goes on to burrow itself uh, while all of them musk oxen you may have seen it uh, that is a uh, that's the smell that you can go on to have it a uh, caribou and uh, reindeer both all all three of them go on to be migrating uh, from one place to another place uh. the limiting factor in this place is going to be severe cold and the shortage of radiant energy that is the shortage of sun's energy and uh, it is because of it that there are going to be variety of type of uh, adaptations of these animals uh. as you can go on to pick it up uh, that is these adaptations one of them is going to be subcutaneous fat this is going to be one of them that is a, a layer of a fat that is just going to be beneath the skin now this goes on to be acting as an insulator and prevents heat from the body that is subcutaneous fat second is a, that is hair is raised it's not going to be falling on the skin it is raised and that is in between this hair the space is going to be used for the purpose of the trapping of the air so hair is raised and brought more in the vertical position it's going to be almost like that this is how the hair is going to be raised and that goes on to help entrapment of a some amount of energy is brought and brought more or less in a vertical condition then blood vessels in the skin constrict and the blood is directed from surface deeper the blood is not from the heart to the surface because once the blood comes from beneath to the surface then this blood will go on to lose its temperature and in the process the body temperature will go on to drop what exactly is happening is that that is it goes into constricted the blood is active from surface deeper layers reducing a loss of heat so there are going to be a variety of mechanism for the purpose of allowing the animals to remain in that place now this is a picture of a polar bear and you can go on to see that how is it that it can go on to match ursus maritimus that's going to be the biological name of it it is a black nose and that's the only thing that is black in this polar bear long claws for tearing apart prey that is with the help of this claw and this claw is retractable it goes on to move out and in out and in if you're going to have a polar bear baby you can go on to see how is it that the claws are going to be moving in and out it has large furry feet for walking on ice and snow that is this type of a feet we are going to be talking about that type of a feet furry feet uh, which goes on to allow it to uh, walk muscle hump is going to be there this is going to be a muscle hump uh, for catching a large prey because that is the way that it can go on to catch it that is uh, uh, the impact it goes on to be having on the creatures is going to be huge i mean one of them is uh, it can going to crush the prey that is a very muscular built up uh, and particularly this muscle which allows him uh, to catch any type of prey most of this prey that they going to be picking up uh, generally fishes uh, and uh, because they go on to be keep on migrating from one place to another place not latitudinal but keep on moving 
then there is increase in the metabolic rate of these animals as well and uh, this allows only few species in primary consumers and therefore this biome is very very vulnerable because there is increase in the metabolic rate uh, you're going to find that the heartbeat is very very fast in this place uh, metabolic rate is very high and that allows only few species to remain they are going to be small herbivores such as the arctic ermine is going to be one of them this is going to be ermine it's a beautiful creature ermine is going to be an actual beautiful creature very sweet and snowy all they have white coats eh, that go on to help them uh, camouflage themselves and why is it that they have to be camouflaging themselves if they do not going to camouflage themselves they will go on to soon fall to the prey so imagine this is how the nature goes into a balancing itself between them Tundra community is of course very variable and very fragile. When we are going to be talking about it, it is of course associated with low diversity. And why it has a associated with low diversity? Uh, the diversity has to be low because the climatic conditions are very very harsh. Eh? That is, uh, the temperature is very low. It's not that it goes on to be warm and a humid type of a climate. The one that you are going to find in the equatorial areas so that is going to be low diversity and of course it has a low growth rate it cannot go on to have a high growth rate for a simple reason that if the growth rate is going to be very very high then there will be so much amount of population that they won't be able to survive at all in this place that goes on to be the adaptation of the animals in the tundra region now there was a climate there were two types of climates. How is it that the climate goes into function in this place? And how is it that the animals go and plants going to respond to it? That makes it a complete natural region. To have more such discussions and analysis, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for notifications on our upcoming videos.